In this episode, I sit down with Kim Halverson, who is a superstar realtor hailing from Bend, Oregon. Today, we talk about the importance of building and nurturing high-quality relationships for an endless referral stream. We also talk about the added value of having a healthy mindset to start your day off on the right foot. We also unpack her strategy for developing yourself as a niche specialist within the market. Now, if you find content like this valuable, please go ahead and hit that subscribe button now. And without further ado, I'm the founder of the Homeward Associates Group out of San Francisco and your host of the Realtor 180 podcast, Sean Kunkler. Kim, thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having me. So happy to be here. Of course. I'm excited to kind of unpack your your adventure, your northern adventure. Yeah. But before we do, if you could, in a couple sentences, just share with the audience who you are and what you do. Great. I'm Kim Halverson. I'm a residential realtor. I'm actually a third generation realtor. I'm a principal broker here in Central Oregon. And Real estate is literally in my DNA, I think. <laughs> That's awesome. I read your bio and it, I, I literally think it is in your DNA. Your Was it your grandfather? Yes. Was in the business and then your mother and your sister? Yes. My great grandfather was a broker in Manhattan. He was a cyclist and he was an agent when he wasn't in the cycling world. And then my grandfather was a lender. It literally is in your blood. Is it the same same side of the family? No, it's both sides. That's amazing. I know. <laughs> All right. So this was your destiny for sure. Yeah. I didn't think it, it would be because I, I hate sales. And I really like in my early years, I didn't like people. <laughs> so it's a surprise turn of events for me. I have those days. Yeah. When I just don't like people. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> I think we, I think that's par for course at some point in this. There's going to be some challenges along the way. Yeah, that's changed though. I love people. <laughs> do you? That's good. I do. Mine changes sometimes, changes back. <laughs> uh, but you've been in the business for a good two decades. Yes, I have. I have. I started in the early 2000s. I started working with my mom in Phoenix. Um. She was very, very busy and successful from the beginning. Um, and she just needed help. And I didn't want to wait tables anymore. And so I convinced her to get uh, help me pay for me to get my real estate license. And I started working with her. That's a sale right there. <laughs> yeah, I needed a change. You know, when you need change, you find a way to get people on your side and to do what you feel you need to do. When there's no other options, you make it happen. I know I do in my life. And then, so from starting in Arizona, then then where did you go? I moved to LA in 2006. And I was super excited about just the creative world of how so many people are doing really cool things with their lives. And you know, you have really small spaces and you have grand estates and all the way from the studio condo to the estate. It was just amazing what people did to make their space beautiful. And so that, that helped me fall in love with LA people and real estate all at once. Nice. And how was that starting? I mean, you basically were working for your mom, obviously in the business and then had to start over. I grew up in the Phoenix area. So my parents had restaurants. So people knew me, they knew my family. And so there was, you know, there was connections already. And then when I went to LA, it was really challenging. I'm a fairly friendly person and I'm, I'm curious about who people are and what they're doing in their lives. And, um, it's not always a warm environment in a big city. And so initially it was like, well, who are you and why should I get to know you? Or no thanks, I have enough friends. And on top of that, 
as I was building my business, we all know what happened in 2008. Everything changed like literally overnight. I had to quickly shift with the change in the real estate market as I was in the beginning stages of a business. So it was like starting over, starting over, starting over. That is intense. Yeah. I mean, it's intense moving to a new city. Just, I moved from Connecticut to San Francisco and that was its own challenges. And then starting a business in addition to, I can only imagine of not really having your your footing yet. And you're also building this other thing. How did you, how did you manage? I mean, just psychologically, how did you, how did you keep yourself like mentally level? You know, that's a good question. It's so long ago. And when it was such a challenging time, I have a hard time remembering how I got through it mentally. Um, But it's kind of what we said was like, where there's a will, there's a way. I knew I didn't want to sit at a desk at a corporate job. And so I love to be around people. I like to be moving and going and in new places and learning about real estate. What I did was in 2008, it was a very hard time for so many people. They were losing their houses, losing their jobs, and sometimes all of the above. So what I quickly realized was I just, you know, from my, my love of helping people, I started to help my clients and their friends avoid foreclosure by doing short sales. Um, so when they, when they owed more, when the house, than the house was worth, I began to negotiate on their behalf so they could sell it. And so, you know, dealing with the big change of that time and, you know, everything was just so hard then. Um, so it was just like, let's just dive in and just get through this together. And it was months and months and months waiting for bank's approval on the sale. But the beautiful thing that happened is that when the home was sold and the homeowner was like relieved of that, that burden of, you know, losing their home or letting it go, you know, that's, that's very humbling. Their lives began to change. They, they got the job, their health got better. You know, it was just, it was like the light started to shine again in their lives. So, you know, in those like challenging, stressful times, it was really cool to see the transformation that that tough time brought for people. It was a very bleak time for a lot of years. Yeah. Not dissimilar from what we all just lived through, but it was much brief, much more brief and much different. But the early days of the pandemic, that uncertainty and the just the the daily anxiety of trying to figure out what the heck is going on, especially if you're running your own business. I mean, I thought when the pandemic happened, I thought, okay, this is when the market's going to change again. We were were due for a correction. Values were like at all time high. And I thought, okay, this is when the change happens, but it, it didn't, it went the exact opposite way. Yeah. The feds overcorrected by, Giving everybody a virtually a zero percent mortgage, and uh, and here we are. We're now paying for that. We're shifting now. I think the Bay Area, San Francisco. We are definitely in the middle of a shift. Okay, it's interesting, but it's very property specific of the shift that's happening. But all, most all of my colleagues across the board, we've all seen a reduction in our our volume. We've also seen. Fewer properties hit the market. Buyers are more hesitant. Mm -hmm. We'll get through it. It's just a matter of time. But it sounds like to get through 2008, you you became a specialist within a niche. I did. Yeah, I did. I became a specialist in short sales. And I hope and pray I don't have to do them again because they're very, very difficult, very challenging. I hope we don't get anything there. Anything with the bank. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I hope, I, yeah, I agree. I hope the economy doesn't get there. And then anytime you're working directly with a bank like that, it's a nightmare. It is. It is. 
I mean, I think they have better systems now. I mean, back then we were still faxing documents. <laughs> I don't see the faxing coming back. So I think if people do get in that scenario where they have to consider that, I don't think it will be as grueling as it was 10 plus years ago. I agree. I mean, that's the savings grace with, with technology. Things have, and they've gotten so much easier. And I, I mean, there's, I have two teenage boys. I don't even think they know what a fax machine is. So it's good. We've trended out of that. <laughs> yeah. No more faxing. Thank you. <laughs> So after you've, this I find fascinating. So you start from scratch in Arizona, you start over in LA, and then you decide, I'm going to start over again. I know, I know. And it was, it's weird because it was starting over again. And I'm like, why am I doing this to myself? Like the market is changing again. And it came down to a couple of things. It was, you know, it was like, first of all, it was like, I felt like LA was like the center of the world. You know, we have the best restaurants, we have the best real estate, we have the beach, the mountains. And so it was like, well, wait a minute. I mean, there's other beautiful places in the world, first of all. And second of all, most of my time and energy was all about work. So I didn't have a good work-life balance. I was in the car anywhere from two to four hours a day, not going very far, <laughs> just sitting in traffic. I just started to think about my life and, you know, as time goes by, like, do I really want to stay in a place only because of money and work? And then I started to feel that yuck factor, you know, like I'm just staying in LA because I'm afraid to move. I'm afraid to let go of the business. Um, and I love my clients. I still keep in touch with them, but it was a little bit of a selfish move so I could have a better quality of life, less time in the, in the car and also be less of a dream killer. You know, you move to LA and I worked on the West side and you really can't find a home with a yard under a million dollars that isn't like a tear down or across the street from some, you know, eyesore. <laughs> and so I just, I thought like it would be really nice to, first of all, have a great quality of life where I can, instead of walking, driving for two hours, I could go hiking on like a break. And that would be like 10 minutes away. I planned for the market shift. I learned in the downturn of the last market to save and live below my means and, you know, basically have no credit card debt. And so all of that, all of that hard lessons from the last move and the last market change, I feel like set me up to be able to make a decision to move to somewhere that I would want to be as, you know, the years go on, that I could have a better quality of life. I hope people didn't just glaze over that, but I, I think that's such an important thing as being an entrepreneur is just managing your money really well, because in real estate, obviously we have these huge influxes of money and then these dry spells and and, and they're, they're sometimes they're, they have nothing to do with us. Like it's not a sales slump in the traditional sense of the word. It's like an economic slump can knock people out of the real estate business indefinitely. Absolutely. I mean, not only is an economic slump get you out, like cause you to get out of the real estate business or any business, it takes a toll on your health your mental health, your family. So to just have that cushion to be able to weather the storm. I learned, you know, there's these financial baby steps that you could just Google them. And, you know, you have your emergency fund and you pay off your credit cards and you have at least six months in reserves for your living expenses. So I quickly got all of that together 
are, you know, around when I could around the last market change. Cause I don't, I don't want to ever, if you've been through a hard time financially, you don't ever want to do it again. It's true. I remember my, my grandparents, they lived through the great depression and when my grand, both of them passed away, um, not that long ago, but they had squirreled a significant amount of money in the safe, just cash ready to go. Mm -hmm. The rainy days come and you don't know when. And so just, I, I, again, I just, the importance of managing your finances well. There's a, a phenomenal book that I only heard of and picked up a few years ago, but it completely changed my business. It's Profit First. And there's a whole formula in there to essentially how how do you allocate the funds within your business and then as an as an owner how much do you draw back out of it and then and basically just and run and build from from that that completely changed the game for me because thankfully i've been around long enough to know that these cycles do indeed happen but they're also a great time to take market share because as other agents are struggling, there's that's an opportunity to expand your footprint and to acquire new targets or uh, clients rather. And then when things start turning around, you can grow at a much, much quicker rate. Yes. So starting again from scratch in, in Bend, which you didn't, I, I, I kind of say it in jest, but, but you weren't starting from scratch. You started with a very strong base of understanding people in the business and the market. You understand how to read disclosures and look at things. Of course, things are labeled different and there's nuances within the market, but fundamentally, there's a lot that's the same. What were, when you, let's just kind of rewind the first month in this new place what did you do? Like, how did you, what was your mindset and how did you actually get started? I don't know if I could boil it down to a month because it, this was years in the making. So I was visiting Ben for years, dreaming of living here. And I was telling my agent friends, I'm really thinking of buying a place in Bend and possibly moving there. And so it was a conversation you know, that I had had with myself and my family. And then I started talking to my, my agent community about it and some clients. Before my first month, I was already making plans to be here. So, but if I could boil it down to one month, what I would say is, um, I just started getting to know real estate here. I just, you know, the basics. What's, you know, what's the median sales price? What are the neighborhoods? How is the, t how is the city, um, laid out? Like, you know, we have an east side of town and a west side of town, and there's very distinct differences. And then, then I was looking like, okay, so everybody that comes to Bend, they either want to live here or they get a job here. And so where are they coming from? So I looked at, you know, the, the major markets where people are moving to here from. And I began to network with agents from those communities. I learned quickly as an agent how to collaborate without ego. That's, you know, one of our compass principles. And so it did take a lot of me letting my ego down from, hey, I am, maybe I have 18, 19 years of real estate experience and I can close, I can negotiate, I can close, but putting that ego aside, I have to, you know, be a beginner again, which is actually a really good thing to do. Be a beginner, learn the market, be humble. And, um, it was challenging because uh, I had to get, I had to get a local area code phone number. <laughs> because people were not returning my call because I have a different area code, you know. That's funny. So it was just those those little nuances that um, 
you know, as simple as someone returning your phone call, I had to quickly um, adjust to. I agree. You have to assimilate to basically to make the client and the other agents comfortable. I know I do it here. If I see it, if I have a listing and somebody with an out of area uh, area code calls me, I kind of, you kind of already start to expect the questions because they're not from the area as, as an agent. Like you just kind of, you know, all the players in the, in the immediate area. And then if they're outside of it, there's, I agree. I think that was a smart, that's a smart move and a smart strategy. So how did you start networking? Did you do it online or was it in person? Like what was your, to, to the other feeder markets, how were you putting your name out there as, Hey, I'm Kim. I'm, I have all this experience and I'm now in this new, new area. Yeah. Well, I mean, the networking came in, um, cause I, I was in BNI for like nine years in LA. And so I really learned how to, um, network and just kind of get to the point of, you know, why we're all here and make connections. And so I just started, um, you know, within Compass, I just started joining referral groups because if you know how to give a referral, you know the importance of, um, you know, how that agent's going to handle your client and you want to make sure they help them as much as they need all the way to the end. And I really understood that. I valued that. I worked really hard to build my business in LA and I loved referrals. I love that an, an agent will send you a client who is, you know, like new to the area or they're moving. And it's really crucial that they have someone take care of them because it's a big life transition. Usually if someone's moving out of state or moving in state. Um, so I already had, I had that. You know, I had that understanding and that really helped me not only, you know, make the connection with other agents in, you know, like San Francisco, Seattle. It also helped put them at ease that I knew what I was doing. Yes, I am not born and raised in Bend, Oregon, but I'm pretty much born and raised in real estate. And I myself, I've been a buyer here. I relocated here. So I know that feeling of, you're excited to be here. You want to figure it out and you just need someone to kind of help guide you through that. So it's very fresh for me. I had a couple of referrals going out from out of San Francisco to, I've had a couple go to Connecticut and New York, but it's, if somebody isn't part of a referral network group online and they haven't done it, I would find one and have a referral go out to be on the receiving side and it's astonishing the different styles that different agents have and what the different people think is going to be important to you and what they're leading with. And you get anything from like the, Hey, I'm available to the people who send you a four page biography and everything in between. It's astonishing. And so I, I, it, clearly you have the the experience to know how to drill down. Yeah. It's an elegant sale. It's like, how do you sell yourself enough without overselling or underselling, but just give them enough information to actually want to call you back because they're getting inundated. Yes, they are. And not, not every agent gets the value of a referral. I had this one seller he sold his house and he basically moved to Nashville and he had enough money to buy three houses, all cash. And I, that poor man, I had to introduce him to like four different agents until that agent got it. Like this guy is a cash buyer. He's going to buy three properties. Like let's help him, you know? So, um, yeah, I, I mean, I've just, you know, you kind of learn, you learn through the mistakes and the personalities and you kind of know right away if somebody really gets what your client needs. You can tell just by speaking to somebody within a first couple of minutes, if your client is going to be a good fit with them right out of the gate. I recently had 
one of my dear, dear friends wanted to buy a second home and it was just outside of an area I wasn't comfortable and familiar enough with. So I wanted to call in an expert and it was a Friday night. It was probably eight o'clock when he pinged me and there was a property he wanted to see. And I'm like searching frantically to find him an agent who will show him the property the next day. I must have called a half dozen people. One person out of all of them, as the phone is ringing, I get a text and he writes, hey, sorry, on a call, I'll call you back in five minutes. The other six people, I've, I left voicemails, shot them texts. A couple people didn't call me back till the next day. Two people didn't call me until two days later. And this one guy called me immediately. And it's just, it's even that, that simple attentiveness to your point is like the, the value of this referral is it's money in the bank because a colleague has teed this up to you for you. And it's, it's a, it's this golden handoff and all you have to do is show up and do the work. Yes. But I mean, you've worked for months and years with this referrer, referral client. So yeah, I, I, sometimes it, it's frustrating because you just don't know why people don't understand the value of a referral. A referral is like, it's like the best compliment and the most beautiful thing. That is the crux of, of my business from either my clients directly or from realtors across the nation who know of my reputation, which it sounds like that's what you carried up. So do you, it sounds like likely you get a ton of referrals from your LA network of realtors and then your LA network of past clients and clients and friends? Yeah. Well, most of my referrals are, it's a mixture of past clients who have become agents and also encompass agents throughout the country. Yeah. Unfortunately, right now there is no compass in Oregon. So, um, I've, if there's a need for a Oregon referral in compass, everybody says my name, but I don't work all of Oregon. I do have great contacts in other areas and other cities that I, I'll make the introduction. I don't get a referral fee out of it, but I, you know, it's, it's good karma. It's good to be a giver. So I, I do make introductions for like Portland or Ashland or Eugene. Um, and you know, and then there was that, this one referral where they're like, they have the property. They just need you to make the offer, but it was, you know, four hours away. And, and I said, you should really talk to Lisa. She knows the area better than I do. I think she'd do better than me even making an offer. And so it's, um, it's important that you do a good job. And if you can't do it, you know, who can't. I've been in that same position where you just know at, at the bottom, at, you know, in your heart, you're like, I, I can do it, but I'm not going to be a hundred percent the best person. And you, it's sometimes it's better to just to, to give it, hand it to somebody who, you know, will ultimately make, make, the whole situation good or better. Let's say you have a referral from a realtor. Do you do anything after you receive the referral? Meaning, do you keep in touch with them, the the referring agent? Do you send gifts? Do you have, like, what's your, do you have a secret sauce? I think the secret sauce is doing an amazing job and making sure they get their referral fee and um, keeping in touch with the referring agent and the client. Um, I have sent gifts in the past, um, but I, I feel like we all get so many, we all have so many things to deal with. I don't feel like gifts are really needed. I think it's more important of doing an amazing job and keeping in touch with people after the closing. My business transformed when we created a program to stay in contact with all of our clients afterwards. And it's all calendared out, it's scheduled, and it's a, it's an entire robust program. But virtue of that, you we stay top of mind and we get more referrals. And I have clients calling me all the time like, oh, we're thinking about painting. Who do you recommend? Or we're thinking about this. I had a client call me up and said, 
hey, my dad passed away. The property's in LA. Who do you have? And that's those are those referrals we're talking about. So I, it's incredibly important to stay to stay in the loop and stay connected with them on a, on, a, on that very personal on just a personal level of I, I was joking earlier saying I don't sometimes I don't like people but like when you just genuinely like your clients and you genuinely care and you are reaching out it's it's completely different agreed it is I'm just writing down somebody's name I need to keep in touch with <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I have a thousand emails to myself from myself that are, it'll just be the person's name of like, oh my gosh, I haven't, I haven't called them in a while or I'll drive by their house and I'm like, oh my gosh, I have to call so-and-so. Yeah. I mean, so what do you, so like, what do you do when like this person I'm thinking of, I've, tr- I've kept in touch with her, but now that, now that the sale is over, she doesn't, she'll, she'll write me back or text me back once in a while. But I feel like she's just like really happy in her home. And mm. some people, they just think of you as like, I'll get back to you when I need you. I really had to adopt the, the mindset of relationships are a place to go and give something, not a place to go and get something. And so if we send a gift or we send a card or I make a call, I have to do it in a way where I have zero expectation like I don't expect them to respond. I don't expect them to acknowledge. I don't expect a thank you. I expect nothing. It gets easier. It makes it easier because I think it's just uncomfortable for people to say, oh, thank you. Or, or like, thanks for reaching out. Nice to hear from you. And so I, I, I don't know, their lives happen. And so they just don't. We send different gifts and cards through the different seasons and we're just we're constantly looking for different ways to kind of pop in and say hi um again with no no sales pitch of just a hello we have brokers to run tuesday and you go look at property and i pulled up to go look at a property and i just happened to park directly in front of my client's house and so i took a picture of my car with their house in the background and I text them and I just said, I promise I'm not stalking you. I'm going to look at the house next door. And then we kind of joked, we went back and forth and then it kind of, the text evolved and it wound up turning into um, dinner. They invited me over for dinner and we hung out. So I try to do it when I reach out, I try to do it with humor. I find it, it's just easier. It's easier for everybody. I would say for the most part, People just don't acknowledge or don't say anything. Yeah. The bulk of my sales listings are past clients or referrals from my past clients or real um, realtors outside of the market. And so even though I'm not seeing it work, I know it's working. And, and it just, it just does. And that's, it's when I we really put that into to motion, full effect. That's, it, it, I would say, three months later. That's when the business really started started to transform for me. How are you staying in touch with your past LA clients, and then how are you staying in touch with your past LA colleagues? Because I feel like they're you have two really really big pools now to go after we keep in touch on social media. So if they have like a life event or something fun happen, I'll just give them a call or text and just check in and say hello. Um, and so that's always fun. And, um, and for my LA colleagues, it's pretty much the same. We're, I'm very active on social media and some of my close agent friends are too. Um, so that's how we keep in touch. And then you know, when I have referrals, I ha- I finally found a really great team that wants to collaborate and refer and accept referrals. Um, I had a hard time finding an agent or agents that could help a client who wanted, you know, to know the value of their home. I'm not active in that community. So I would say, hey, Joe, can you give marry a CMA and it became, it was almost like 
it was uh, a little uncomfortable or out of the way for the agent. And so I had to, over the last few years, interview agents to know who could take something and run with it, even if it didn't amount to something. That's been like the big hurdle of keeping in touch with agents is finding somebody who can help my LA clients. But the fun part has just been seeing how they grow and how they're changing. It's amazing how, even though the market has changed, many of the agents are still doing so well and they're making the best out of it. That blows my mind. If I were in LA and I knew that you moved to Oregon, I would have done anything to figure out how to overlap to keep your business basically going down there marketing for you thus so I can get be a part of that transaction like that blows me away that somebody wouldn't it just that floors me that somebody wouldn't send a CMA like if somebody called me up I would be like sure no problem like let's let's figure this out. And actually, you probably have a whole Rolodex of names. Let's send everybody one, and we'll talk about how we can you know parlay this into more business. Yeah, you would think that would be a no brainer, but I finally found you in LA. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Oh, well, congrats on finding that, Thank that you. right person. <laughs> they should be able to to keep it going. There's um. I just heard a talk with um, Courtney Smith Wiesmore, who not only did she build like a phenomenally huge team, I, their, her team was doing close to two hundred million a year, but now she's in charge of um, coaching top performing teams at Compass, and she was saying that if a if a an agent retires, which you didn't retire, but you moved from a market. If they do nothing with their database in four years, it's completely dead. I can understand that. That's scary. That's scary that our business in four years, if you do, if you don't cultivate, water it, do anything in four years, it's, you won't have it. It'll be completely gone. It's terrifying. That's a lot longer than I would think. Um, I would have thought it would have been like one year, (laughs) two years, maybe. That's what it feels like, doesn't it? It does. If I don't hear from somebody again, like if I go to a dentist for the first time and then I never hear from them again, I will forget their name. But if they kind of keep top of mind, if they stay in front of me, um, you're right. I feel like a year feels more proportionate, but I guess it would depend on the depth of that initial relationship. True, true. To grow your business now in this new market, what are what are some of your daily activities? Yeah, so my daily activities, they're super glamorous, super exciting. <laughs> um, so every day I look at the hot sheet. I look at what's a new listing, what's sold, what's pending, what's expired, all of those things. I need to know what's going on in the market. So that's like foundational for me. And then it's also like having the conversations with people I meet, having coffee with local business owners, um, going to events is important. But I think out of all the activities, I think the most important I'm finding for me is um, my morning routine of working out and affirmations. Uh, What I'm really challenged by in starting over in a new market is is mentally staying positive. So I feel like if I can be more intentional about where my thoughts are, everything I do throughout the day from learning what's new in the market to networking with other agents to talking to people who may be client, maybe clients, maybe not. Um, for me, the mental side has been really a major game changer. And I don't know if it's age or just like starting over or, you know, wherever we're at in the um, astrology world <laughs> or I am just noticing like mentally it's, it's everything. 
like just having like that mental clarity, that positive attitude, um, it changes the conversation and it changes the trajectory of how I look at things and how I talk to people. A hundred percent agree. I could not agree more. During the pandemic, I built in the garage, I built out a gym, a full gym. And so my day starts, I walk downstairs, I grab a coffee and I immediately go into the gym and I hop on the treadmill right away. And I usually listen to an audiobook or something motivational. It has to be motivational because the same thing, I want everything from that point forward to be skewed with a positive light that I can take this on and I am going to have a good day in spite of what's happening. And then I go about my day. Then I usually have an actual like weight training workout at like five or six most nights. Um, And I like to break it up that way. But you're right that I, the morning ritual is for me, it's crucial because I've had those days where you, you know, you grab a coffee, you're trying to put some food in your face as you run out the door to sit in traffic for two hours and you're just miserable. Like it, it just, it deteriorates you very quickly. And so, yes, I, that whatever the morning ritual is for somebody is, it just needs to be a positive spin. It does. It's so crucial. I think, I think as the real estate market is changing and, you know, buy, buyers are having to, you know, really adjust to the interest rates as well. I think that having that mental clarity and calmness is, um, it's very foundational and, and I almost don't care what happens throughout the day. As long as I can have that for myself, I'm going to be okay. It makes it easier to get through it though. When, when you're centered, it's easier for you to be centered for your clients. Or if you're having a hell of a transaction and you have to talk to that agent who just wants to combat you at, at every turn, it's if you're the calm centered one, that they lose their steam. And it's, it's uh, for me, I find it, it's a much better way to, to live than to be completely freaked out and stressed out and, and burnt out ultimately is what happens. Yeah. Do you have like a mantra or do you do um, gratitudes or what do you, what's your positive introduction? The exercise, anything, whether it's, yoga or treadmill or bike or walk outside that that mentally is is a mantra on its own i mean it changes my whole body chemistry some days it's really hard to wake up and feel awake <laughs> and and that that does it so that's kind of starts it and then i think of you know i think of like you know i'm starting over And I have to trust that everything's going to work out. So lately, I got this from Sky Michaels, is everything is unfolding in front of us. And we just have to have fun and watch it happen. And so that's, that's been my, my, my mantra mindset lately. Because the more we try to make things happen and, you know, push and it just kind of falls apart. So um, I'm putting my intention into doing all the things we need to do to keep the business going, but almost like stepping back and watching things unfold instead of forcing things to happen. And that has created a lot of mental space and is making things fun. And that's such a different perspective too, right? When you're It's the, it's your whole, it's your vocabulary. If, if you look at a list of things to do and you say, Oh, I have to do these. It's a negative skew versus these will be fun to do, or I'm looking forward to it, or I'm excited to do it. Yeah. And even if it's something you have to do, having the mindset of like, well, let's do it and see what happens. Like, let's just watch it unfold. It's such a good, simple reminder to not get too much ahead of ourselves in this business and just slow down, you know, take a breath, take a beat, figure out, 
or let let that thing just figure itself out. And sometimes it's just a matter of time. Mm-hmm. Or just listen and watch it happen because the, sometimes the more we get involved and o- over finesse, it makes things worse. Way worse. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's like, uh, well, do you want this to be like, do you want to torment yourself to make this happen? Or you want to just like allow it to happen and be, you know, be a facilitator of it. I just, for some reason, I had like the visual of like an over-decorated cake. It's like, sometimes you just have to stop, (laughs) just stop. (laughs) The one piece of decoration was plenty. You didn't need the 25 other things that were put on there. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) On that note, we actually just railed through the time. Oh, great. Thank you. Thank you. That was really fun. If somebody wanted to reach out because their client is moving to Bend, Oregon, what is the absolute best way for them to reach out to you? I think the best way would be to either call or text. And our number here is 541-371-2787. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Sean.